So today I've got the uh, Holden Commodore RS. Now, this is not your traditional Holden Commodore. This is actually a rebadged insignia. So those who don't know much about the Holden Commodore, there was a rich Australian history and the Holden Commodore for me is sort of close to the heart, having previously owned a fair few of them and really loving the car, being a huge Holden fan. So when they stopped making the Holdens in Australia, obviously it was a huge disappointment. With the new Holden Commodore, the Reed Badge Holden Commodore, uh, this had big shoes to fill this Commodore. And it was sort of a, a completely different sort of move from Holden as well, sort of bring, bring this car in, a car that wasn't made uh, on home soil in Australia. So today to start with, what I'll do is I'm gonna take you around this Holden Commodore RS, which I have today, for those that aren't in Australia, also known as the uh, Insignia. Taking a look at the car from the outside, I reckon it's a pretty good looking car, to be honest with you. It's not as big as the uh, Holden Commodore it replaces, but it's still a reasonable size and still would be a good family car. So taking a bit of a closer look here, we can see it's got some 18 inch wheels on it. Not really crash hot about the wheels. I think they you obviously could upgrade to some nicer wheels there. Not sort of too sporty, I don't think, but look, these ones are 18s and they're 245 wide on the rear here and you've also got the 245 wides on the front so coming around the front and we're having a look at the front big front holden grille here the front of it keeps i think the holden look the, the front lights are fairly similar to sort of the previous holdens that have been designed in australia in the past it doesn't have any fog lights this one down the bottom it's got its front front sensors which if i come in here you'll be able to see and then what you'll also be able to see is the uh, front camera there for the lane assist. So just coming back again, having a look at that, it does have LED strips that sit just above the headlights. You can't see it now because the car's not on. I think that they look all right. If I just actually open the car, you might be able to see those. No, they don't, but you can see where it's flashing. That's exactly where the um, LED strips are, just below that blinker back around from the other side just to take another look at it and looking at the lines here on the car I really do like the lines in there so just below the door handles there you can see there's a sort of wavy line that sort of goes up towards the rear of the car there just to give it a bit of distinction between other cars and then back around the uh, back of the car here now again keeping kind of traditionally with that Commodore look at the back the rear lights sort of do follow on reasonably similar to the uh, the VF Commodore which it replaced uh, it's got the dual exhaust here which I'm not a big fan of to be honest I kind of think you either make them a bit bigger or a different shape it's they're, they're looking a bit sort of out of date if you have a look at all the other modern cars today where they're sort of more integrated and a bit wider and and bigger looking even though that those ones are mainly fake uh, and these ones look like they're pretty pretty real there yeah they're definitely uh they're definitely real and then you can see also the rear sensors here and it's also got the rear camera so at the back here you can also it's got it's got a little wing lip here to make it look a bit sportier i don't mind it it's just a small small lip anything bigger and i think it just look out of place to be honest and then We'll go back around the, the side here again just to take another look at it before we jump in the car and, and show you the inside of it. All right, what we'll do now is jump in and, and take a look what it looks like inside. So this one's got the uh, proximity key. Again, I've, as, as I've mentioned in a few videos before with some of these non-European cars, you've got to actually click on it. So if I click around it with my Kenner Pocket Wear, if I was in a European car, it would open straight away for me, which I'd like. This one, I have to find that silver button there. So I have to put my hand there, actually press on it, and now it will open for me. So now inside the, the Holden Commodore RS. So you've got the heads up dials here. Nothing special, fairly plain. So I start it quickly so you can see. Just on now, there, I've got a bit of a needle sweep. So a very slow needle sweep of all the needles as you start it. Looking at the dials, they're fairly plain nothing really exciting there you've got you've got it on the speedo which i kind of think is a bit strange it goes up by 10 increments to 60 and then it goes by 20 and then when you get over 
180, it goes to sort of 30 increments with 270 as a top speed, which is kind of an unusual top speed. Back around the cabin here, it's fairly plain. I do like it a bit better than maybe some of the Japanese counterparts, but only just. I think that screen for the infotainment system could be a bit bigger. It does have Apple CarPlay on this, but what I found is that it was really difficult to actually get into Apple CarPlay, or not as easy as other cars, let's say, or maybe, maybe not difficult. What I had to do is I had to actually press that projection button that you can see there on the left, and then eventually project it to, to, to my phone. Not many options on here, so you've got your audio, you've got like a picture gallery, I don't know if you, whoever would use that much. The phone is just literally going in the, if you press the phone, it goes in the call sound projection. Like I said, it actually enables CarPlay settings. Obviously, you have a range of settings on there. And then you've got your climate control and you can do the driving modes here. So if it lets me go in there, it does touch screen. It will show me sports and normal. So not too many driving modes. You can customize it here. The vehicle must be turned on. Okay, so let's turn on the car. And see if we can customize and how much customization we can do so, yeah so it's like normal and sports so i don't think there's really much customization there that you can do other parts of the cabin you've got just below the infotainment system you have the controls for the infotainment system if you don't want to use the, the touch screen and, and put your finger marks all over it fairly basic looking controls but i still think they're reasonably neat and, and sort of tidy as you can see you've got your climate control with dual zone climate control some cup holders here bit of storage space then you've got your gear stick it does have tiptronic so you can put it in the tiptronic here on the side if you want to do the manual changes it's hard to show you but we've got uh, a few little buttons here you can put in the sports mode the other one you can't really see is the lane assist that you can turn on and off then the you've got another one just below there which is for the car stop and start you can turn off and on you've got another one which is more for parking so it allows you to so if I put in reverse now and press it there it's automatic park assist so if it can align me up with something and can see exactly where I am, it will help me park the car. This stage, it doesn't really see a parking spot, so it won't be able to help align me into one. And then that last button is just the turning on the parking sensors on or off. Electric handbrake, some more storage space. And in the center console, we've got one USB port. Seats, fairly sporty fabric nothing really too special you can adjust your leg rest on the car if you like so by pressing down here it opens the seat up a bit more uh, to give you more of a more of a bit of a leg rest there i personally never use them the handles and some of the plastic on the car is okay a bit of a carbon fiber look around the handles and then we'll come back around and have a look at what's on the steering wheel. Fairly basic as I said around the cabin also, but I don't mind the look. It looks doesn't look too cheap, but it could definitely look a bit more fancy. We've got the cruise control here, which is all controlled from the left-hand side of the steering wheel. And we've also got the collision assist. We'll slow down the car if it gets closer to the vehicle in front while on cruise control. On the right here, we can answer the phone call, change the volume, change the radio station, things like that. Being a sportsman, I'm surprised it doesn't have any of the flappy paddle Tiptronic gear shifts here on the steering wheel. I'd have expected it, it would have had it. And if you have a look here, you've got your wipers on one side and then you've got your blinkers on the other side. And you've also got the controls for the, the little DIS sort of display near the speedo with seeing different things if you'd like to see the speed and some other options you've got your headlight buttons down here on the right you've got the window controls and mirror controls and you can flip the mirrors electrically which is always handy so previous model had all this stuff in the center console 
area, so a tiny bit different. All right, we'll, we'll jump in the back now and I'll show you how much room we've got in the back and what else we've got in the uh, back seat. So in the back of the car, I did say at the start of this video, it's sort of a bit smaller than the Commodores it's replaced, but you still get fantastic leg room in here. That seat in front of me is not pushed forward too much. You would be more than comfortable sitting here on a long trip and have more than enough room. And just having a look behind the passenger seat there as well. You've got two USB ports here for entertainment and charging entertainment devices for the family. The middle seat doesn't look like the most comfiest middle seat. I'm not sure how you'd go on a longer drive. Sitting in it myself now, it feels that you sit reasonably high and it seems that you're sort of encroaching on the seats next to you. So I'm not sure how comfy it would be with five people in here. And that's where you do notice the size difference between the old and new where the old you would have comfortably sat five adults in here. The seats in the rear, sporty with a bit of a lip on the side there to sort of tuck you in. You've got, as usual in most cars, the cup holders here in the center console. That's pretty much what you've got around here. So what I'll do is we'll walk around the back of the car and we'll, we'll show you the, uh, the boot. Okay, I've got to be honest, it took me a while to figure out how to open this boot. Uh, I looked on the key and the key has nothing to open the boot. I tried that and that does not open the boot. I then went back into the car and tried to find a switch for opening it and couldn't. And then came back out here and figured out the way to open the boot. So I know of at least so far is to press the badge and it pops open like this. And it's got like a hatchback style which I find is a bit different for a sedan style boot similar to what you get in say the Audi A5 or something so having a look the boot space it's pretty big probably not as big as the Commodore that it replaces but more than enough to squeeze a fair few suitcases in here and then if you want you could take this off this cargo cover off here to give you a bit more in the back or put them put more on the parcel tray steep storage slots there and just having a look, not too much storage under the wheel arches here. You've just got a space saver, 80 kilometer tire in there. That's the boot. It's a manual close, so no buttons here. And it looks like no option to put a button here. So even the spec'd up models would have a manual close. It feels quite heavy when closing it actually. Yeah, that's interesting. Again, that's the back of the uh, Holden. What we'll do is, as usual, we'll jump in the car, take it for a spin, and then I can tell you what it's like to drive. So now I've been driving the uh, Holden Commodore RS, or codenamed the uh, ZB, and now I can tell you what I think about it. Look, so full disclosure, this is not the first time that I've driven the Holden Commodore RS. I did drive one about 18 months ago, so I have had some experience driving this before and, and getting an idea of, of what it's like. This particular Holden Commodore RS I've got has got the four-cylinder two-liter engine. There's also an RS where you can get the V6 3.6-liter engine, and you can have that's all-wheel drive as well. Where this one is just front-wheel drive. Look, the car itself I think drives really well. So one of the things that impresses me about this car is the the performance. It's obviously not, not a nice performance car, but one thing about the uh, all Holden Commodores before this was that. They were always quite powerful for, for a family car. So you always had that powerful, always surprised you when you jumped in, put your foot down, it just sort of went, which you wouldn't really expect a family car to do. And I guess this does follow on from that tradition. As I said before, this isn't a V6. So it's got a four-cylinder turbo in it, but it performs really well. When I first jumped in the car, I, I actually thought this was the uh, V6 version before I did a bit more research this car. So it feels really quick when I put the foot down. Obviously it doesn't feel like a big performance car, but for sort of your basic claim of the car, when you put your foot down, you've got more than enough power on tap. I've never sort of felt like it's underpowered. Even sitting on the highway at 100 kilometers an hour, it's only just sitting above a thousand revs. Quite low for a, a car with a, it's a reasonable size with just a four cylinder engine in it. It's got 191 kilowatt, quite a lot reasonably powerful. And it's about 350 newton meters of torque. You've got, as I said, a fair bit of power there. 
other things I can tell you about the car, you might be able to see just behind me here, the vision, uh, not the greatest. As you can see, that the headrest uh, pushed up a bit higher. It doesn't give you too much rear view vision. And if you look in the rear view mirror, that's all you're really seeing. And it's, you, you've got the small glass window out there, so you're not seeing a huge amount. So the vision in the car could be, could be a bit better, I think. There's not too many blind spots, but there are a few little blind spots ar around the car there. The stereo system in it, it's not too bad. I guess it's what you'd expect, say middle of the line in it. The gearbox in this is pretty good. It's got a nine speed auto in it. And as I said, it uses all the gears quite smartly. So it really makes that four cylinder two liter turbo work really well with this sort of gearbox. And there's no clunking or anything between the gears. The gear changes are all really smooth. The inside of the car, which I showed you before, as I said, I think it's still a bit basic. Yeah, this is not the top of the line model. So if you go a bit higher, you'll probably get some more tech and it will look a bit more polished inside. But I just thought that it could be finished off a tiny bit better. The car, it's put together reasonably well. I'd still say it doesn't feel like a completely solid car. When I don't, I don't, it definitely doesn't feel like a prestige car to me things I haven't been that impressed with in the car is the air conditioning now it's an extremely hot day today so just showing you it's yeah, as you can see there it's 45 degrees which is ridiculously hot today but the temperature inside the car the air conditioner hasn't been able to sort of make it super comfortable like of course it's it's, it's keeping it cool enough but I would think it cool down the car a lot quicker than it, than it has so that's probably one of the, one of the things that I haven't thought was great. The car's got a heap of technology in it. I'll t tell you some of the bits and pieces that it has. It's got automation, automated emergency braking, pedestrian detection, forward collision alert with heads up warning, lane departure warning, lane assist, so it will pull you back into your lane if you go out of your lane, a distance indicator to see how far you're in front of the car, side blind zone alert so on the left hand side it'll start flashing if there's a car in your blind spot and then it's got a rear cross traffic alert which basically tells you if there's um, traffic around you or on a, on a cross section the handling in the car is really good i can't really fault it too much uh, you can push it around turns reasonably the brakes are pretty good on so one of the other things i didn't really like in the car is the, the reverse parking system so it doesn't really show you um, or at least in the, in the default settings that I have at the moment, really had your distance from the car. So it obviously gives you the camera view from the rear, but you've just got to rely on the camera and how close you are to the car. And it starts beeping quite erratically when you're not even really too close to the car. So it's kind of hard to sometimes, if you're just relying on the camera, sort of guesstimate how cl close you are to the car, because sometimes the camera can't be completely relied on. And then when I went forward for the front parking sensors, they kind of, went on then off so which was a bit strange when i was quite close to the car in front of me so uh, i think that system can be a bit better and looks a bit buggy in this car some of the other things to, to sort of mention in the car is it's the fuel efficiency is reasonably good they they quote around the seven liters per hundred kilometers I've, I've been driving this a bit and the fuel, fuel gauge isn't going down to, that much so I'd, I'd say it's probably around there um probably in, in real real world driving obviously a bit higher than that so what do i think of the car to sort of sum up look i don't mind it it's a tiny bit of a step up from the commodore it replaces even though it's not supposed to be a direct replacement and then you've got no v8 which takes all the performance enthusiasts out of the picture as, as buyers there it's got a lot of technology as i spoke about before it handles well, the acceleration's good, it does have a few bugs here and there. I think the car looks good. Um, in my sort of in, in impression, uh, it could be finished off a tiny bit better. And I personally, uh, from being a previous Holden Commodore owner, personally wouldn't jump out to buy this car. Um, so it, it's nothing that's for me super exciting, but uh, as, as a car, um, if I'm comparing it with, say, a, a mid-size SUV, I'd probably per purchase this over a mid-size SUV. I prefer this uh, more than the, the mid-size SUVs out there. You can, as I said, the, have a bit more fun driving this while doing everything that the mid-size SUV can do. And and you have the all-wheel drive option in this if you, if you want if you did require something that was an all-wheel drive version. So if you're looking um, at a family car, this is definitely 
um, one you should also consider before just going out and getting the, the, the usual SUV, which most people seem to be doing these days. So yeah, I mean, look, to sum things up, it's not a bad car. There's a few things that could be, as I said, refined a bit better, a few little bugs here and there in it, but um, generally like a really comfortable car to drive.